I am Syrian, a refugee, and I happen to be a woman as well. You might consider this as an unfortunate combination, but I am here to challenge every assumption you might have about me and the vast community that I am part of. I will share my story as someone who once lost everything. My home, my education, and my every hope. But today, I'm so hopeful that not even the sky is the limit. I stand here to share with you the five important steps that restored my hope, and I believe should be available for every refugee. Step one, do not label me or any other refugee. In Syria, I was a pretty regular kid. I had a large extended family, a lot of friends. I loved my home. I was proud of my country. Most Syrian kids got told by their parents what they should be when they grow up. A doctor or engineer say, I kept on pestering on my mom about what I should do until one day she caved in and said, you love traveling, yes? You're good at talking, yes? You're always fascinated whenever we walk past one of the embassies in Damascus, yes? So why not become a diplomat? So I started the dream of becoming an ambassador, representing my country abroad, living a life of diplomacy and refinement. I would study political science. But then war came, and my desire to become a Syrian ambassador evaporated. See, to be an ambassador, you have to truly have faith in your country. But the worsening conflict in Syria meant that my father was in so much danger, he was forced to flee the country that I longed to one day represent. He left our home in Damascus in 2014. He was granted asylum in the UK. But we remained in Syria, and the danger spread, making it unsafe for us to go to school. So we moved to another school. But the same thing happened. In fact, we had to change schools three times because each one got caught up in the fighting and bombing. We were lucky. We were granted family reunion visas to come to Britain. So on April 27th, when I had just turned 16, my mother, two younger brothers and I traveled from Damascus to Birmingham via Turkey, and saw my father again for the first time in over a year. I thought this was my great new beginning. I had high expectations, big hopes and dreams. I thought life was going to get easier, happier, then gradually get back to normal. It did not. When I first set foot on British soil, I had no idea how negative the word refugee was. But after a while of watching TV and reading the papers, I began to see how people treat refugees. The coldness of welcome, the stereotyping, and I hated that. I just wanted to blend in, to fade away, to be just another face in the crowd, not someone with a big arrow pointing to them, saying, refugee. You know, a refugee is like any other human being. The one difference between us and most other people is a big one. We lost our homes and been forced to seek safety in other countries. But that is a change of circumstances, not a change from a human being into a thing or from person into a problem. I challenge you to find a group of people more allergic to violence and discrimination than refugees. Isn't it obvious? We've led fear and persecution. We're peaceful by definition. So why is it that some politicians paint a picture that we are the danger? Remember, I did not choose this. 
I'm someone who had a home, a family, a mother who thought I would make a good diplomat, a plan for the future, and no thought of having to leave any of it behind. So don't assume anything about me just because any of these titles. A Muslim, a refugee, an Arab, a female. So step one is do not label, which leads me to step two. Think about education as being as important as food, water, and safety for refugees. Once I was in Birmingham, I expected to start school immediately, meet new people, make friends, but things didn't pan out like that. I was rejected from three schools as they had no idea how to treat my Syrian secondary education certificates. I was told I had no qualification and therefore could not continue with my studies. Sometimes the rejection came with a sympathetic letter. Sometimes it was plain spoken and harsh. I told them they should test me, test what I knew, but they weren't willing to do so. I never experienced torture, so I can't tell you what that is like, and I cannot claim that boredom is worse than anything else. But I can tell you that I was more frightened by boredom and loneliness of being shut up at home all day, unable to learn in a British school, than by any other day I lived in Damascus when the bombs were raining down. Boredom crushes the soul. My parents and I were determined, so after three months, I had the chance to get tested and enter a school. But my ideas of studying political science were crushed. My English wasn't good enough. Luckily, my maths and science carried me through. When I was told that political science was too hard for me, I needed to pick something else that I could be good at. My father's friend suggested medical engineering. And without any idea myself, I thought, why not? But that was soon to change. During my second year in college, when I was applying to universities, my mother and I were staying in a hotel by Heathrow Airport. I woke up, and from the big window screen of my room, I saw planes landing and taking off. And I was fascinated. Literally, I just wanted to sit and watch them the whole day. After we checked out of the hotel, I asked my mom if we can go to one of the airport parking places so I could observe planes closely. Sitting in that car park, I felt a glow of happiness. I turned to my mom and said, Mom, I'm not going to do medical engineering. I'm going to do aviation engineering instead. She gave me a look, and then she laughed. And then she said, no, you won't. You've already written your personal statement for five universities. I couldn't let it go. Two weeks after, I spoke to my mom's friend about it, and he cautioned me that passing through security in an airport is difficult enough for Arabs, let alone becoming pilots. <laughs> His words set me on fire. It redoubled my passion. I wondered how many dreams were crushed just because of this kind of discouragement. Not only did I want to study aviation because it fascinated me, but I wanted to prove people wrong. I wanted to be that person who bucks the trend, the refugee becoming a pilot after being rejected from school, the person who was once looked upon as a burden. I am truly determined to challenge every difficulty, every stereotype, and to encourage others to do the same and stand up for themselves and what they believe in, regardless and no matter to what, to show that Everything is possible, as long as you believe in yourself and your abilities. So step two is, think about education as being as important as food, water, and safety for refugees. And that leads me to step three, support university places for refugees. 
I've recently secured a place at Brunel University to study aviation engineering with pilot studies. Standing here with education under my belt and a university career ahead of me, I know I'm one of the lucky ones. There are thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, of refugees desperate to go to university, and nothing like enough places for them. Globally, about a third of young people the right age for university are enrolled. For refugees of the relevant age, that figure is 1%. Only 1%. So how can refugees go home once it's safe to do so, to rebuild their communities without people among them who became experts in their fields, whether doctors, engineers, political scientists, and many other more professions? These professions require degrees. So step three is my call for you to expand scholarships and access to university to give refugees the ability to study with the same determination that I have. Step four. Don't tell me I can't do something because I'm a girl. If you ask the British what they're most proud of, very few of them will answer Heathrow Airport. But when I was watching planes taking off and landing at Heathrow, that's when I got the flying bug. It's the place that makes me feel most at home, most in touch with who I am and who I want to be. I applied to study aviation, everyone warning me that it's unlikely because I'm a female. Of course they're right. Only 5% of the world's pilots are women. I wonder if there are any other female Syrian pilots. Could I be the only female Syrian refugee pilot one day? <laughs> I enjoyed maths and physics, and the fact that there are so few female pilots, and probably none of who are also refugee, made me even more determined. There is clearly a problem that only 5% of the world's pilots are women. So step four is my call to remove barriers and make it a welcoming profession for all, regardless of gender. Step five, believe in us, and we will reward and surprise you. For me, my proudest moment was opening my exam results that enabled me to go to university. For my mother, though, her proudest moment was yet to come. I was honored by another pilot, you might have heard of him. His name is William, and his brother is Harry. <laughs> I received Diana's Lexi Award from them for my work in delivering this message. Believe in young people. What I am most proud of is my work with UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, to advocate for families like mine to reunite when war has separated them. It's a horrifying thought, but had I been 18, not 16, the British government wouldn't have reunited me with my dad, as I would have been considered as an adult. I would have been left behind. My mom would have had to make a terrible decision, to save my brothers or to stay and suffer with me. But by reuniting me with my family, I'm able to thrive rather than just survive. I'm so grateful for the opportunities I've been given in Britain that I'm committed to giving back and hopefully inspire others along the way. The lesson is, if you believe in us, we will reward you with our commitment and talent. So a recall of the five steps. Do not label. Think about education as important as food, water, and safety for refugees. Support university places for refugees. Girls can do anything and believe in us. So what's my promise? 
Britain is my home now, but I want to assure you that I will never forget about my people. Today, that includes Syrian girls and women who suffer from discrimination and the refugee family that I will always be part of until Syria is safe to call home again. I'm not only one thing. I am a Syrian, a refugee, a female, a pilot in the making. For me, winning a place at university is just the start. The idea of becoming a pilot is still new for me. This month, I will get airborne, controlling the cockpit, spread my wings, flying solo for the first time. I know I will face hurdles to get my wings. Some will stereotype Arabs as unsafe. Some won't like women at the controls. I will be the same person doing her job flying a plane. <laughs> the same person who was once underestimated and turned away, who was once looked upon as a burden, who was once called an outsider, who no one believed in. I do not just believe. I know for a fact that when one woman succeeds, we all succeed and we all make a difference. All that is required is compassion and faith. I'm just taking off on my journey, and I will do whatever I can to live up to my dream. So, in a few years' time, you will set off on a holiday <laughs> or attend a business trip. And hopefully, you will sit and hear the same voice you're hearing just now. But without education, however, I could never hope to say these words. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. Thank you.